out of Finland, this is the Reluctant Theologian Podcast. I am your host, Dr. R.T. Mullins from the University of Helsinki. I know that many of you have been patiently waiting for this episode. Some of you are incredibly hyped up to hear this one. Today, I have my final episode with Dr. Sam Liebens. We get into all sorts of fun stuff related to heaven and hell, the problem of evil, sin and atonement. And then, of course, we get into a detailed discussion about hypertime. If you have questions or topics that you would like to hear on the show, you can send me a message at rtmullins.com. If you'd like to support the show, you can donate money to my Patreon account or my Ko-fi account. Any donation amount helps in so many different ways. I greatly appreciate all the support that people have already offered. Well, ready or not, here's Sam and I chatting about the Atonement Hypertime. Enjoy. All right, so in today's episode, I want to look at that third principle of Judaism. So Sam, why don't you just remind everybody, like, what is that third principle of Judaism, and then just kind of explain it a bit for us? Yeah, sure. So, you know, on on, on the system of thought, according to which there are three principles of Jewish faith, um, Maimonides famously had 13, but later medieval scholars said, no, you can kind of round those 13 down and kind of group them under three uh, broader headings. Your listeners will hopefully remember the first is um, um, that, that God exists and created the universe, so God is creator. The second is that uh, God is involved in revealing his will to the Jewish people through the Torah, so uh, revelation. And the third principle is to do with God exercising providential care over the universe, which includes matters uh, to do with uh, the eschaton, the end of days, with uh, with divine justice, reward and punishment, all of those fall under the heading of, of God's kind of providential care. Fra- Franz Rosenzweig, an early 20th century thinker, uh, famously kind of put these three principles around kind of something of a catchphrase is creation, revelation, redemption. Nice. Okay. So that, I mean, that's a really good summary here. So we got creation, uh, revelation, redemption. And so today we're looking at this redemption theme here. Mm-hmm. So in the book, you identify something that you call like, there's like a couple different themes that you say are in God's eschatological toolbox, like his toolbox for how he's going to bring about like the redemption at the end of days. So tell me a little bit about like some of the different themes related to this sort of ultimate uh, salvation. Like what, what's some of the stuff going on here? Uh, okay. So wh- one key piece of this third principle is going to have to flesh out exactly what we mean uh, by the messianic promise at the heart of Judaism. And, and, you know, if only strategically, in order to make these principles work as kind of a definition of Judaism that kind of closes off, off other religions, you know, these are the axioms at the heart of Judaism. Uh, mm. Some of them are going to be shared with other Abrahamic faiths, Christianity and Islam, but clearly... There's, there's going to be something, I imagine, axiomatically different between Christianity and, and Judaism. And it seems to me that, that um, it's going to be about our messianic expectations. So a large part of the, the eighth chapter of my book lays out how traditionally Jews have understood the messianic promise or how Jewish expectations have evolved over time, perhaps uh, in terms of what we expect from the Messiah. And those expectations are in some ways quite different from uh, Christian expectations. Uh, Jewish messianism uh, does not expect that there will be two comings. They expect that there will be uh, one appearance of the Messiah Mm -hmm. and the Messiah will achieve certain kind of concrete uh, achievements that can be measured certain people may come and go who have all of the the properties that kind of qualifies them from being a messiah. The Rambam Maimonides calls such people presumptive messiahs. The suggestion is maybe that Shimon Bar Kochba, the leader of of one of the Jewish rebellions against the Roman uh, occupation of of the land of Israel, uh, was such a presumptive figure, somebody who could have been the messiah if only things had gone right for him. Uh, But but uh, he wasn't because he didn't build the third temple. He didn't usher in a time of universal peace. Um, there, there are certain conditions. I lay them out in the book. But I think, knowing your predilections philosophically, where you want to probably go with this conversation 
relates to other parts of the eschatological toolbox. Because I said the Messiah is only just one part of God's providential care over the universe, right? And it's all very nice to say, oh, well, in the end of days, God will bring a Messiah. But one of the things that makes Judaism less plausible as a religion is exactly what makes Christianity and Islam and other faiths that believe in an omnipotent, omnibenevolent, uh, omniscient God implausible. And that's the problem of evil. And, mm-hmm. and, if, and if the third principle says that God providentially cares for the universe, well, it's very nice that one day he'll make things right. He'll bring a Messiah. But what about the suffering that's going on right now? One of the jobs of my book um, isn't to prove that these principles are true. And in fact, um, the third principle is is more based upon hope than demonstration, right? It may be plausible or reasonable hope. But I do hope at least to make the principles plausible. And I think collectively plausible. And I do think that the existence of uh, pain and suffering, uh, uh, gratuitous and, and uh, you know, horrifying evils render the entire package less plausible so i spend a large part of uh of this eighth eighth chapter speaking about some of the other kind of powers uh that may be available to god in his eschatological toolbox that would somehow at least make it plausible to hope that there really is an all-powerful and all-loving and all-knowing god uh, governing things right now, despite this counter evidence from pain and suffering. Right. So, so you've got some claims about Messiah, and then you've also got mm-hmm. this just general of like, well, when the Messiah comes, he's supposed to supposed to get rid of evil, supposed yeah. to kind of bring about some sort of like yeah. ultimate justice and ultimate redemption. Yeah. So we gotta we gotta do something about that. Um, yeah. yeah. And so there's two in particular in your book that that lead into a discussion on the philosophy of time. And so that's yeah, obviously that's what I want to get into. Yes. Yeah. So you've got this. Uh, so you've got one which is called ultimate forgiveness. Yep. And so what this says is that like once a sinner is like genuinely like repentant, like when they've really like, you know, done everything they need to do, like the best for forgiveness, they've really got a contrite heart, all these sort of things, then God's going to erase their sins from history. And so those sins will never have occurred. Yeah. And so I was like, that's provocative. So I want to yep. get into that one. <laughs> and then you've got this other one, which is called No More Evil, uh, that you, you and Tyrone had worked on as well. And so, right. it's, so it says that like one day it, it will be the case that nothing bad will ever have happened. Yep. And so what that does is it sounds like God's changing the past. Yes, he is. Yeah, yes. right. And so like, so what's, what's interesting is like a lot of discussions historically, when they're looking at omnipotence, they're just going to say, God can't change the past. Like that's, 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 not, that's just off the table. But like you're doing some really fun stuff with hyper time in order to give God yeah. the power to like, change the past. That's right. So yeah, so I want to get into that. So just start by telling mm-hmm. us what is hyper time. Okay, well, well I just you made me think um, Howard Wettstein just wrote... Uh, a brief review, like a mini review of the book for um, for a journal called Tradition, which is kind mm. of uh, the premier journal, I suppose, of, of, of Orthodox Jewish thought. And um, <laughs> he says, I just want to quote it because it's quite funny. He says something like this. It, here it is. Finally, with respect to Albo's third thesis, God's providential role, Liebens puts forth the philosophy of time developed by Liebens and Tyron Goldschmidt and its consequences for salvation. This is Liebens at his most speculative, advancing an account of God's ultimate justice from which he draws hope, even if we're not convinced that it is correct. He offers his philosophy of time in support of the idea, which he attributes to the Ishbitzer Rebbe, that God will, in the end, remove all present and past traces of evil. Good luck. (laughs) (laughs) this is great i love it okay (laughs) so so yeah you you ask um um, what is what is hyper time but before i get to that right Mm -hmm. let me let me spell out briefly what what i mean by ultimate forgiveness what i mean by yeah uh the the no more evil uh uh, doctrine these uh, as you rightly say and howard wetstein rightly points out these were developed before i wrote the book with Tyron Goldschmidt in a provocative article called The Promise of a New Past, um, which kind of uh, wears on its title the the idea that we're playing with time. And the thought is that, you know, yes, it's true that right now things are terrible. (laughs) You know, there's lots of horrible things going on. And um, a Messiah coming and making things very nice from that point onwards is all well and good. But what about the people? Who, who lived before the coming of the Messiah. And, you know, there's, 
various theodicies you could appeal to, the, the free will defense, uh, various theodicies, mm-hmm. uh, divine intimacy theodicy, whatever whatever theodicy you particularly like. But, but Tyron and I were following some hints that actually start in the Bible, right? So uh, think of um, in the book of Isaiah, it says, anochi, anochi, hu I, even I, shall erase your transgressions. And I will not remember your sins. Um, what does it mean for an omniscient God not to remember something? Right? And in the book of Jeremiah, it says, you know, there will come a time where people will search for the sins of Israel and Judah, and they will not find them. The Ainana, they will not be. Right. What does it mean? I mean, they mm-hmm. should be there in the historical record, right? Right. And following these biblical allusions that become a little bit more explicit in the work of some Hasidic thinkers in 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 uh, actually in the, in the in the 19th century. I'm thinking of some 19th century Polish Hasidic thinkers. You get this idea that well, maybe when the Messiah comes, he won't just fix things forward looking. He'll he'll fix things even looking backwards. Mm. And there are two ways this suggestion gets fleshed out. And it's not clear to me, you know, whether somebody could coherently believe that both of these suggestions will be realized, perhaps at different stages in what what I call hyper history, or or whether, you know, one of them would be good enough and you wouldn't need the other. I don't know. But both suggestions are out there. They, they are there in God's eschatological toolbox. What are they? There's ultimate forgiveness. As you said, God will subject to a person repenting um, and kind of um, doing whatever it is that's necessary for a person to do in order to be forgiven for various sins. God will make it the case that they never even sinned in the first place. And the no more evil uh, suggestion. So that first suggestion, ultimate forgiveness, we see in the works of Rabbi Sadok Cohen of Lublin, who is a, a fascinating uh, Hasidic thinker, a Polish Hasidic thinker. And then no more evil is even more radical. It suggests, no, God will make it the case that nothing bad, nothing bad ever happened, not just um, that the sins didn't occur, natural evils, just anything that's bad won't have occurred eventually. And and we see that suggestion in, in the works, actually, of Rabbi Sadok's teacher, uh, the Ishbit Rebbe, but by Mordechai Yosef Lehner, uh, slightly earlier in the 19th century uh, from the Polish town of Ishbitz, which is why he's known as the Ishbitzer. And then you say, yeah, Sam, you know, don't analytic philosophers think there's something paradoxical about changing in the past, right? Right. And yes, they do, but they, they only do because they're insufficiently imaginative. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. And... I suppose the point of eschatology, eschatology is much more, I think, about hope than it is about kind of knowledge. And here the metaphysician should be licensed, I think, to be even wildly speculative. So, well, for all we know, God could do this. Mm-hmm. Now, certain analytic philosophers, Michael Dummett, for example, will turn around and say, no, for all we know, God can't do that. He can't change the past because there's a paradox involved in changing the past. Okay, What's the paradox? Well, it's something like this. Let's imagine that in my youth, my my mother cruelly subjected me to eating vegetables. Mm-hmm. I hated eating my greens and my, my, the worst. my cruel mother subjected me to eating my greens. But then, uh, having studied the metaphysics of time, I, uh, I moved into physics and I created a time machine. And I went back and I saved myself from the indignity of ever having to eat my greens. Every time my mum tried to put, you know, because I kept a log of every time she gave sure. me food. So I just, I just traveled back to all those moments and jumped in as, as, an, as my adult self to defend my child self from eating my greens. And so it turns out I never ate my greens. Now, the, the paradox here is, well, if I succeeded, right, then it turns out I never ate my greens. Mm-hmm. So if, it's, if I succeeded, what did I even change? Right. Right. Either it was always the case that I never ate my greens because somehow there's this weird kind of causal loop such that it was always the case that adult Sam arrived on the scene to prevent young Sam from eating his greens, 
Or I ate my greens and adult Sam failed. But what can't happen is that I changed the past because if I changed the past and I succeeded, you should be able to ask, well, what did you succeed in changing? Right. <laughs> but if I succeeded, then the thing I changed never happened. And if the thing I changed never happened, then I, I couldn't have changed it. Like you see the kind right. of paradox? Right. So, in fact, when I, when I teach the philosophy of time to my uh, poor, unsuspecting students at the University of Haifa, I make the distinction between dynamic time travel stories and static time travel stories. Mm -hmm. So a dynamic time travel story is when something actually changes. And that's, that is where there's a fear of paradox. The static, you know, uh, in his paper on the paradoxes of time travel, um, oh, David Lewis, David Lewis, David Lewis cites the case of Robert Heinlein as a sci-fi author who gets sci-fi right. He writes time travel stories without these paradoxes because it's, it turns out to be the case that things were always the way the time traveler made them. You have these weird loops, but no paradox. For, for, for people interested in like a, a, a more contemporary example of that, Interstellar, the movie, is mm -hmm. an example of a kind of static causal loop that involves kind of time travel or at least information from the future being sent backwards. But it was always being sent backwards. And it was always the case that the past was as it was, right? So nothing is, ch uh, no past is erased or changed by the future, uh, even if it's somehow influenced by the future. But, but if you want to change the past, then you get these paradoxes. And indeed, both ultimate forgiveness of Rab Sadaka Cohen and no more evil of the Ispitzer Rebbe uh, suggest that the past will be changed, which is exactly where you get the paradoxes. Now, the way to uh, salvage dynamic time travel is to appeal to this thing called hypertime. So the idea is that time is a dimension of change, and um, it measures change. It measures the rate of change, right? So if something's changing, you can talk about, well, how long did it take to change? And you, you measure that in, in the dimension called time. And as soon as you start about, as soon as you start talking about time itself changing, you get into certain quandaries, right? <laughs> to put it mildly, yeah. Right. So, so you know, even the growing block theory, which doesn't suggest that the past is changeable, it does say that time itself seems to undergo a change in that it grows, right? Space time grows. Uh, into the director of the, the direction of the future, and I suppose any a theorist it could be a moving spotlight theory, uh, could be a presentist. Or I, I don't really understand presentism. You'll have to explain it to me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, whether there's any such, whether there's really change for present, I don't. Anyway, but um, uh, certainly in the moving spotlight theory, certainly in the growing block theory, uh, time is changing. Right, uh, the the spotlight of presentness is is uh, sweeping uh, across the face of time from the direction of the past in the, into the, di the direction of the future, or if you're going block theory, space time is growing into the future, um, the outermost edge of the growth being what we call the present at any given moment. But what do you mean at any given moment? Time itself is a collection of moments. What do you mean time is changing? How fast is time growing, right? And you mm -hmm. get these things, well, it's growing at the rate of one, per, one second per second, right? Um, but, but that might not be sensible because, you know, you're measuring time by itself and one second per second is that. Is, is this it doesn't sound like a rate anymore. It, it doesn't, doesn't sound like it's really a measurement. Yeah, That's right. So, uh, you know, Marcosi and there, there, there are, there are uh, philosophers who try to address this worry without appeal to hypertime. But one way you could go is you could say, well, look, if time itself changes, you need, a di you need a, another dimension of change that measures the rate, let's say, of the change of time, right? So just as temporal things change at a rate that can be measured by the dimension called time, time itself might change over the course, not of time, but over the course of hypertime. And so then you can talk about earlier hypertimes, later hypertimes, and just because the timeline looks a certain way in the hyper-present doesn't guarantee that it will look that way in the hyper-future. And indeed, 
one way of cashing out what's happening in the growing block theory is that over the course of hypertime, space-time grows so that at earlier hypertimes, space-time is smaller, and at later hypertimes, space-time is larger. So that's hypertime. And once you've got hypertime, time itself can become much more malleable. And perhaps uh, in, that, in, in that direction lies a solution to the supposed paradoxes of dynamic time travel that, that can render uh, what had seemed paradoxical about uh, ultimate forgiveness and no more evil uh, not paradoxical. And indeed, if they're not paradoxical, then I can turn around and say to you, yes, I know things seem right now as if no loving God could have created this universe. But just because things are the way they are in the hyper present doesn't mean they always hyper will be the way that they are in the hyper present. Right. So I want to make sure I'm kind of following this. So I've got so time is oh, right, no, I know because this is <laughs> right. So because this is a lot of crazy stuff here. So we've got time as you're seeing it is just like kind of this dimension along which changes take place. Mm-hmm. But it seems like time itself or these different moments they're changing in some kind of sense. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and changing along crazy, what? Even if you're not crazy like me, like me, you mm-hmm. don't think the past can change. But if you think there's such a thing as the flow of time, if you think time right. is itself dynamic in any way. Yeah, right. On. Exactly. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. because like, so I'm a presentist and I want to be like, mm-hmm. what's happening right now? Mm-hmm. Well, that's changing. Like that's different. Mm-hmm. Changing mm-hmm. along what? Uh, ooh, oh, okay. I, well, I was going to say time, but it sounds like time itself is changing. And so what are you going to do? Aha. Well, I've got this hyper time thing. That's another dimension along which time changes. Mm-hmm. So we've got two temporal dimensions. I've got just your standard bog standard, like time dimension. And then this second temporal dimension, which is hyper time. Mm-hmm. So one of the things you mentioned and that I've mentioned as well is these different ontologies of time. So we like talked a bit about like we mentioned presentism and growing block, but I I think it'd be good for us to kind of spell out some of these different uh, Mm -hmm. ontologies because Mm -hmm. you can have an ontology of time. And then for the hyper time dimension, you can have a completely different ontology if you want, you know, so help us out uh, out here. What are some of the different options here? So just what ontologies of time like are there, which one are you wanting to work with? And then which ontology of hyper time are you wanting to work with? Right. So, so, so modeled loosely on the B theory and the A theory of, uh, of, of McTaggart, uh, um, from 19, when was it? Very early 1900s. Yeah. There's a, there's a, cause he had a couple of different papers that were kind of mm-hmm. like around like, I want to say like 1902 to like five or something in there. Yeah. 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 So, so he's actually got the A theory, the B theory and the C theory. And it's not clear that he's really I mean, he wants to make an ontological argument. He wants to, he, McTaggart himself wants to argue that time is ultimately real. Right. Um, but it's not clear to me that the A theory, the B theory, and the C theory uh, uh, are, are themselves ontologies of time. They're just kind of like linguistic ways of, you know, talking about time, ordering time. Um, right. However, mapping on loosely to what McTaggart, well, more or less loosely, to what McTaggart calls uh, the B theory and the A theory, you can distinguish between two different families of ontologies of time. So one family is very small. I think it only has really one member. And it's that static kind of uh, version of, of time uh, called eternalism, which maps on to what McTaggart calls the B theory. And according to eternalism, all times timelessly exist. Kind of They, they eternally exist. Uh, the past is still there and the future is still there. And no given time is at all kind of privileged. We think our time is special because uh, we, we call it the present. Mm-hmm. But people in the past are calling the time that they're in the present and people in the future are calling the time that they're in the present. It's just an indexical like the word, like the word here, right? You right now are in Helsinki. And if you were to use the word here, it would pick out Helsinki. And I'm, you know, in Haifa. So when I use the word here right now, I pick out uh, my office in, in the University of Haifa. Um, um, but my office is objectively no more here in some like robust sense of here in right. than Helsinki is. It's just where I happen to be, where you happen to be. So likewise, no time is like robustly now in a kind of absolute sense in which no other time is. That's the eternalist picture. It's a static picture of time. That's one f- very small <laughs> family of ontologies the reason i call it a family is because i want to contrast it with another family which is a larger family and you could call these the atheoretic conceptions of time or dynamic conceptions of time and what all of these uh, ontologies have 
in common is that the present is somehow privileged. Okay, So you have presentism, which says that the present is privileged because the present is the only time that exists. The past no longer exists. The future uh, uh, doesn't yet exist. Only the present exists. That's what makes the present special. The, uh, the word here is not like the word now. Here uh, doesn't really pick out anything particularly special in space other than where you happen to be. But now picks out something special. It picks out the, you know, the only moment that exists. Right. Uh, that's, that's the presentist view. The growing block theory says, no, 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 no. Um, the present is special, but not because it's the only moment that exists. We all know the past exists as well, since the past, let's say, is what settles past tense statements, right? What makes it true that certain history books are more accurate than others? The past does, right? The past exists, and it's the arbiter of what's true and what's false in the past tense. And the asymmetry of the past and the future, the past is settled, but the future isn't settled, is explained, according to the growing block theory, by this ontology, where all past moments exist, past moments exist, the present exists, but the future doesn't. And space-time, as, you know, as history gets longer, grows into that void that we call the future. Uh, that's another you know, dynamic theory of time. Things are actually changing. You have the, the growing, you have the moving spotlight theory of time, which is just like eternalism, you might think, in its fundamental ontology, because it says, yes, the past exists, the present exists, and the future exists, just like the eternalist thinks. But things aren't static, and that's why uh, the moving spotlight theory belongs in this family, the dynamic family, and, and not with uh, um, uh, eternalism, because what's changing? Well, there's this special, perhaps even ineffable uh, property uh, called presentness that, that, um, that moves over the surface of time in one direction. And when you fall under the light of presentness, you can say truly that your moment is now, right? I suppose there's a sense in which my past selves are calling their moment now, but they're doing so falsely. Right. right. Because they are no longer in the spotlight. They were right for a minute, right? But they're no longer correct. That's the moving spotlight theory. You, you could even have others. I mean, the ones I've said are the most common. But, you know, in theory, you could have a shrinking block theory, according to which the past doesn't exist. Only the future does and the present. And as, I suppose, history unfolds, the future continues to shrink until there's nothing left and the whole universe kind of snuffs out of existence. Some people take multiple futures very seriously and say, it's not just there are multiple ways the future could pan out, but, but there are multiple real futures that exist right now. And as history unfolds, some of those uh, uh, possible futures, which were once just as actual as the others, kind of drop out of being. That's the falling branch theory of time. So you think of time as like a, uh, the past as a very long tree trunk. And the future is lots of different branching branches, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're all equally real. Uh, and the present uh, is the first branching point. And as presentness moves along this tree, it chooses one branch at each, bra at each branching point, And therefore, the trunk, I suppose, gets longer. That's the past. Um, and the branches that weren't selected fall away. That's the uh, uh, falling branch theory. But for me, what the important distinction here, and, and this is where I follow in the hallowed footsteps of uh, Hud Hudson, the, import, the important distinction here is that some of these theories are static, namely one, the eternalism, and some of these ontologies are dynamic. They think that time itself is undergoing kind of a change, be it in, in getting longer, getting shorter, having bits dropping off of it, having a, a spotlight move across it. I suppose the presentist has some notion of change because the moment that exists changes from, from moment to moment. Only mm -hmm. one exists, but from moment to moment, it changes. So these dynamic theories have, have time changing. Uh, what, what Hudson says, and, and I agree with him, is that there's a, been a, a, you know, something of a failure of imagination among metaphysicians until now, because they imagine things changing. 
but they all imagine things changing in kind of one direction and in a kind of incremental, quite ordered way, right? So on the growing block theory, time gets bigger, you know, in an incremental way, growing into the future. On the shrinking block, it gets smaller incrementally uh, in exactly the same direction, uh, um, getting shorter. Um, we could say the same things about presentism, movements, but like they're all unidirectional changes. Right. And, and uh, in a kind of very ordered way. And Hudson's like, well, you know, if you're going to, if you can make, if you can make sense of dynamic theories at all, we could be much more imaginative. Maybe things grow in all sorts of shapes and forms and directions. Maybe the past can get longer, not just, not just the, the future, not, you know, sorry, maybe the future can get longer, not just the past or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. You could go either way. So, yeah, because he's right. got this idea of this, this morphing block because it's the like, morphing block. yeah. So because if I remember that correctly, so remind me if this is this is accurate. So with the morphing block, I've got, say, like, say I got like an eternalist kind of look. And so it's like mm-hmm. it's got the past, the present, and the future mm-hmm. on eternalism. Like those things are those moments. They're fixed. Like you mm-hmm. can't do anything with them. Mm-hmm. But the morphing block it's like, well, what if I just kind of like rearrange them? Or what if I made the block of time a little bit shorter? Yep. Or what if I made it a little bit longer? Like I could, yep. I could do a whole bunch of different stuff with this block. It's not like completely and utterly fixed, like Good. all those other ontologies you've been playing around with. Yeah, I mean, what the morphing block allows for, and this is this is the work to which Hud Hudson puts it. I mean, he doesn't primarily put it to eschatological work in the way that uh, Goldschmidt and I do. Uh, the work he primarily puts it to is this fascinating reconciliation of a literal reading of the book of Genesis and yeah. contemporary uh, cosmology. And he says, well, look, how could you prove to me that this isn't true? The following scenario. It hyper was the case. And you're, we can talk a little bit about hypertenses later, but mm-hmm. uh, um, it hyper was the case. And for now, you can just say it was the case, right? That 6,000 years ago, God created the world in, in seven days, exactly as 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 described accurately in the book of Genesis. And he placed Adam and Eve in a garden, perhaps in some other spatial uh, uh, dimensions to the ones uh, um, that we are familiar with. But he placed them in in a garden and j- just as described. And then and then they 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 deliberately disobeyed God. And he was really upset with them. And he said, you know, do you guys really deserve to be the, the, the fruit of my handiwork after just s- six days of work? Do you really deserve to have this intimate relationship with me, the creator? Do you deserve to be such that I breathed the breath of life into your nostrils? I don't think so anymore. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add billions of years of past to the timeline in which you, you exist. And from now on, it will be the case that you evolved slowly from slimy, uh, you know, proteins out of the swamp, the primordial swamp, after after billions of years of previous kind of uh, cosmological explosions, whatever. I will make you a speck of dust on, on you know, <laughs> on yeah. the edge of, uh, you know, an insignificant galaxy um, by adding a whole new past. And therefore, it could be the case that, the physicists are accurately describing uh, the way things happened in the, in the actual past. And the book of Genesis is accurately describing how things were in some sort of previous past that used to be actual, but is no longer actual. Now, if, if time itself can be subject to, subject to change in the way that all of the dynamic theories seem to allow that time can be subject to change, then why can't time be subject to that sort of change where God just takes a whole chunk of new history and copies and pastes it and plonks it on such that, you know, Adam and Eve, having been created six days into history, will now be, uh, it will now be the case that they, you know, without changing anything in their own biographies, without changing anything that happened to them directly, just by adding loads of past, God can make it the case uh, that they were created billions of years in. Um, and it's ingenious because I think what Hudson wants to point out, I don't, I, I don't think readers of his book are being asked to sign on to this. Is like, no. you know, but I think what he's trying to point out in a kind of cheeky and mischievous way 
is that what the new atheists and perhaps certain evangelicals see as a battle about history needn't actually be a battle about history because given certain metaphysics, they can both be telling the truth, right? These, these, these things are about metaphysics, not really about physics. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, um, but that's the, that's the morphing block theory. The morphing block theory is that um, just as time can grow in one direction, Maybe it can grow in the other and God can like add loads of paths that didn't used to be there. Right. And so when, so you could have like a morphing block ontology of time and this mm -hmm. would all be happening in like a hyper time of some sort. That's right. Right, right, right. Okay. Okay. So, so you've got this kind of morphing block sort of view here that we can, we can play around with, but something you mentioned a bit earlier was hypertenses. So, so tell me a little bit about hypertenses, like what's going on here? Well, hypertenses are going to be really important because ultimately they're going to be what solve us from the paradox, uh, you know, solve the paradoxes, right? So we, let's go back to me eating my vegetables. Let's introduce to the English language some new tenses, just like we've got the present, past and future tense that English speakers should be familiar with and able to deploy at will. We can play with hypertenses. So the hyperpresent tense is a way of speaking about how the timeline is hyperpresently, right, at the current moment of time's own evolution through hypertime. The hyperpresent describes how time looks presently, hyperpresently. The hyper the hyperfuture tense describes how uh, history might one day look. So if you think God is going to change the past, we can talk about how the past is hyperpresently, and we can talk about how the pa past hyper will be. So if I have this this searing desire that God will one day erase from my biography the summer of 1999, right? If that if that's a, if that's a really deep and profound hope of mine then even though I know what happened in the summer of 1999, and it's right there, it's there in the past uh, on many ontologies of time, uh, if I talk about, if I, if I deploy the hyper future text, I can talk about my hopes for how the past hyper one day will look. So I'm talking about the hyper future past using the hyper future tense. Um, and I can use the hyper past tense by talking about how the past used to look. So so what sounded paradoxical about me and my vegetable eating is no longer a paradox. I, I can tell you what that story is describing. It's describing the following scenario. It hyper used to be the case that I ate vegetables because my mother forced me to. Mm -hmm. That's not in my past. Why is it not in my past? Because I successfully went back in time as an adult and prevented myself from ever eating vegetables. But did I change something? Yes, I hyper changed something. Why? Because in my hyper past, it was the case that I ate vegetables. So I, it, was the, it was the case that I hyper ate vegetables, but it is hyper no longer the case that I ever changed vegetables because of my successful time travel. And it's by deploying these hypertenses that we're able to avoid what look like the paradoxes of time travel, which are actually linguistic paradoxes that emerge from an insufficiently imaginative and rich vocabulary uh, or, or grammar. Right. Okay. So we've got these, ni these nice hy hypertenses here. So do we have some kind of tensed hypertime then? Is that the case? Like a, what kind of ontology of hypertime do we have? Good. Well, you, you just like there's a choice of temporal ontologies, mm -hmm. uh, you can have a choice of uh, a veritable choice of hyper ontologies. Okay, you could be a hyper eternalist, and if you're a hyper eternalist, that means you think that all hyper times eternally exist. There's a hyper past, a hyper present, a hyper future. You might think that no no, no one of these deserves the the privilege of being called the hyper present, right? Because they all they they, they all exist. It's just you know each each the, the 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 denizens of any given timeline say that uh, yeah all the hyper temporal slices of the denizens at any given uh, timeline are, are, are fervently waving and saying hey uh, this timeline is the hyper present timeline but but none of them are more right than anyone else just like you're no more right to say that Helsinki is here than I am to say that Haifa is here so that would be hyper eternalism. You might think, and I think this is quite a natural uh, uh, way to look at things. It's not ultimately how I look at them, but it's a kind of a natural way to think. If you're a growing block theorist about time, you might think that time and hypertime are kind of growing together. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
so just like there's no future because time is growing into the future there there's no hyper there's no hyper future hyper time too is growing into the future problem is you might think that requires a hyper hyper time because uh, if hyper time is what allows time to change and if hyper time itself is changing you might think you need hyper hyper time right i actually don't think you can there are some nice papers that explain how actually these two are enough because they can both be used to measure the changes of the other uh-huh, um, right right so so actually you, you can block this regress of all sorts of uh, you know an infinite number of hyper 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 times but you can mimic the, or, or model the entire variety of temporal ontologies you can have a, a, like an isomorphically uh, analogous uh, on a uh, choice of ontologies of 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 hyper time but you can you can mix and match you can be a hyper eternalist but uh, a presentist so you, so you think at any given hyper time uh, only one moment exists and that moment at each hyper time is is called the present right uh, you know you you can mix and match you could be a, a growing block theorist about time and a, and a hyper presentist to think that only the hyper present is, is the only is the only hyper time that exists you can mix and match right okay so so now we've got some of these pieces to the puzzle here maybe you can kind of give us some of these different hyper time stories about how you get something like that ultimate forgiveness or that no more evil that we had talked about earlier okay so buckle your seat nuts, everybody um <laughs> This is how Tyron Goldschmidt and I suggest that the ultimate forgiveness and no more evil are at least possible. It could be, it could, the world could be such that these things are doable for a, an omnipotent God. How do you do this? You do this on what uh, 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 Tyron and I call a scene-changing theory of time. Now, a scene-changing theory of time is a combination of uh, temporal and hypertemporal ontologies. Okay. Now, what you need, the magic combination, okay, is this: you need a temporal ontology in which the past exists, because ultimately, if the past doesn't exist, you're going to struggle downstream to make sense of God improving the past. Right. Believe us, we tried. We tried to make it work on as many ontologies as we could, and we, for various technical reasons, we found it very difficult. So you need you need a, an ontology of time according to which the past exists. Of those, you can have your pick. You could be a growing block theorist, an eternalist, a, a, a falling branch theorist, a moving spotlight theorist, whatever you like. And you need to be a hyperpresentist. Now, uh, so a hyper hyperpresentism is the following view. It says this: we can talk about the hyperpast meaningfully. We can talk about the hyperfuture. Meaningfully, but that doesn't mean that the hyper past is an actual place you could go to visit in your hyper time machine. Uh, nor does it mean that the hyper future is a is a place you could go to visit in your hyper time machine. Right? Just like the presentist says that okay, we can talk about the past and we can talk about the future, but they're not real places that you could kind of go to. They don't exist. Only the present exists. The hyper presentist says an analogous thing about hyper time. We can talk about the hyper past. We can talk about the hyper future. We can deploy our hyper tenses just as freely as the presentist deploys tenses. Mm-hmm. But um, like the presentist who denies the existence of, of the future and the past, we hyper presentists uh, deny the existence of the hyper past and the hyper future. Time changes over the course of hyper time, just as physics for the presentist changes over the course of time but let's not fall into the trap of thinking that that entails that there is a place called the hyper present and a place called the hyper future those times don't exist uh, only the hyper present exists now if you have that magic combination a temporal ontology that says the past is a real place and a hyper temporal ontology that can make sense of hyper tenses and yet only allows that the hyper present exists so it's a combination, again, mm-hmm. of hyperpresentism and then any temporal ontology with the past. Any such combination we call a scene-changing theory. And scene-changing theories allow for the universal forgiveness theory of Rav Tzadok and Cohen and for the no more evil uh, theory of, of the Ishbitzer. So I could have something like, so I've got my hyperpresent, 
And that could have something like a, a growing block, but it's also a morphing block because yeah. you can change some stuff with it. That's right. You can change the past. So, so what, so what will happen is we say Gittel. Gittel is a um, somewhat stereotypical Eastern European name for a, 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 a Jewish woman. More modern Orthodox Jews tend to kind of go for Hebrew names where Gittel is a Yiddish name. Okay. So anyway, we have this, this thought, Gittel, uh, she, she did something terrible at time one. Okay. And then at time two, she, she repents and she feels terrible about the sin that she did. Now, let's imagine that we've got a growing block theory. So at time one, when she was doing her terrible sin, time two didn't yet exist. Okay. So time one, um, when she's doing her sin, it, it's only present at, let's call it hyper time one. Okay. At hyper time one, time one is present. And mm -hmm. she's sinning. At uh, hyper time two, time has grown because we're growing. We're growing block theorists, right? Okay. So, so now there's a time one and a time two. Time one is 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 hyper now the past, okay? And time two is the present uh, at hyper time two. And at time two, at hyper time two, Gittel is repenting. She feels so bad, and God is looking down and saying, "Oh, I feel so bad for Gittel. She's so sincere." So time continues to grow. And at time three, which is at hyper time three, God could have made it the case by hyper by then that that there's no sin at time one. So at hyper time three, you've got Gittel laying back on vacation in some nice sunny place, not worried at all about her past because she trusts in God. And mm -hmm. she knows that in her past, there are no sins. She didn't do any sins. And she's right. Because at hyper time three, if you were to get into your DeLorean and travel back to the past, the past exists at hyper time uh, three, right? Because on a scene changing theory, the past exists. So she gets into her DeLorean and she travels back to T1. And lo and behold, she sees that she's not sinning. I don't know what she'll see. We can talk about maybe what she will see later. But she sees that she's not sinning. She's like, ah, I knew it. Okay. Uh, God would erase my sins. And he did, just like Isaiah said. Okay? Now, you might say, okay, she, she didn't sin, but she hyper sinned. Mm -hmm. Right? Isn't her sin still there in the hyper past? It's there at hyper time one when she's sinning at time one. It's there at hyper time two, where she's still sinning at time one and also repenting at time two. It's just vanished at hyper time three. OK, so it's no longer in her past at hyper time three, but it's in her hyper past. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, on a scene changing theory, we are hyper presentists. So if we're standing at hyper time three, hyper time one is not a place. It doesn't exist. Sure, it, it's still true that it hyper was the case that she sinned. But that truth isn't made true by the existence of some hyper past sin. And to, to explain what's going on here, you need to borrow from the presentist. Mm -hmm. How does the presentist explain what makes past tense sentences true? Well, they'll wave their hands around a little bit, but, yeah. they'll, but they'll say it's something about the present. You know, I think the most promising presentist views are going to say something about the present makes it the case that, you know, uh, sees across the Rubicon. Right. So the present has some sort of property that it wouldn't ha it wouldn't have had 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 Caesar not crossed the Rubicon. And it's the instantiation of that property by the present that makes it the case that Caesar crossed the Rubicon. So we can say, OK, the hyper present instantiates a, a property that makes it the, the case that Gittel hyper was sinning. That's a shame. It's a shame that the hyper present has that property. But the, but the past evils are much more unsightly than hyper past evils because on the scene changing theory, past evils still exist in the past forever replaying, so to speak, mm. their horrors. Hyper past evils, by contrast, is just some sort of ontological shadow, some sort of property held by the hyper timeline, that's the hyper present, 
And, and, and I think that, you know, on a scene changing theory where you think the past is a place, but that the hyper past isn't a place, you can actually bestow uh, quite a large axiological difference upon uh, the distinction between past evils and hyper past evils. Past evils are much worse than hyper past evils. And God can indeed make the past better by making past evils mere hyper past evils. Uh, and that's a real improvement because hyperpast evils are just properties that describe some way the past used to be but isn't anymore. Mm. Whereas past evils are like real events that exist forever, you know, replaying their horror and evil. So that that is how a scene changing theory can allow Rav Tzadok to say that uh, Gittel's sin can one day be removed. It's, it's it's worth pointing out in the original source, at least in No More Evil. Uh, Rav Mordechai Yosef Lehner talks about a residual garlic peel. That's his metaphor. He says, God erases the evil and it will be nothing more substantial than a garlic peel. Uh, meaning like you've kind of shaved off the evil, but some kind of shadow of the evil remains. And that shadow is, is, is the, 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 true, the truth of the hyper past tense sentence that Gittel hyper <laughs> But it's really not so bad, Gittel, because the sin is nowhere in your past and hyper past evils are nowhere near as bad as past evils. Right. OK, so I want to see if I get this. So Gittel, uh, so, yeah, so so Gittel did something in the past. Pretty yeah. feels pretty terrible about it. Uh, and if those past events actually exist, like when, mm -hmm. like they would on a growing block, mm -hmm. well, then at each new hyper moment, you've got her feeling bad at one time and then that earlier time let's do that still exists mm -hmm. uh, and so she's doing all the bad stuff there and so she's just like oh gosh this is you know, just awful yeah. just awful she's so ashamed she's ashamed to have mm -hmm. in her past this episode uh that that's still there and will always be there she's ashamed right the stain yeah. she leaves on 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 space time right and so and so that event actually concretely exists that's right at a particular hyper time but at a later hyper time yeah god's gonna be like you know, I forgive you, and I'm yeah. going to get rid of that concrete event. Absolutely. Sure, there's a property, that it, a hyper property that exists at the hyper present uh, yeah. that, you know, states that you did these things. But the concrete event itself yeah. of you doing this particular sin, that's gone. gone. That's yeah. gone. Right. And of course, like a property is not as bad as the event itself. Exactly. And in fact, we, we argue that, you know, presentists might have a somewhat harder time explaining just what's so bad about about past evils because they don't exist right. right whereas we say no past evils concretely exist because if you're a scene changing theorist the one thing you have to accept is the the past exists and they're really bad they're concrete events past evils but hyper past evils yeah they're, they're, it's a shame you know yeah. but it's and much. and so when we're looking at this sort of ultimate forgiveness story, this no more evil story, God's going to do this for all repentant people. Well, what I want to suggest in the book, at least, and I think this is what Tyron and I were getting at as well in the paper, I think I'm more explicit about this in the book, is just that, look, we have no clue, really, what ontology of time is true. But if the scene changing theory is epistemically possible, then it's... It's not unreasonable, once you believe in an all-powerful God, to hope that this might be one of the ways that God makes it the case that there never was any pain or suffering or evil or sin. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm not saying, I'm not going to bet my house uh, on this sure. happening. right? But you know, put it this way, Stephen Mateson, I think, has a really good objection to the free will defense. And it's an objection that I think is kind of obvious, but I think he just states it so well. I think he's a fabulous philosopher, by the way. Um, so street cred to mm -hmm. Steve yeah. I've never met, never met the chap, but there you go. Um, he, he says about the free will defense. So like, imagine, imagine you see a grown adult abusing a child and you have the power to interfere. You say, hold on a minute. The autonomy of that child abuser is very precious to me. And if I interfere, I would be kind of disregarding his autonomy. Like, it'd be a sicker, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> what sort of God just, like, allows children to be abused when he could interfere? Oh, no, no, but they're autonomy. Okay, so give us autonomy. But there maybe there should be some red lines that you mm -hmm. cross every now and again, right? That and God say, will go, oh, all right, I'm going to step in here. Your autonomy isn't worth that, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, why? You know, 
And the free will defense, I think, you know, it's, has never had a very compelling thing to say in, in response to that. It has some things to say, but I, I've never been bowled over by how compelling they are. Well, Tyron and I can say, well, look, maybe it's like this. God would be a tyrant if he didn't intercede. But maybe he just hasn't interceded yet, right? Hyper mm-hmm. yet, right? Maybe it's a good idea to give us free will and not to interfere at all. So long as you can guarantee that one day no one will have suffered, that one hyper day, right? It hyper will be the case that no one would have suffered. So what Stephen Mason is saying is that human freedom is not worth even temporary suffering. And I tend to agree with him, right? But Tyron and I are saying, okay, but maybe human autonomy is worth hyper-temporal suffering. Mm -hmm. What if that suffering isn't just temporary, but it's hyper-temporary? It one day will be the case. It hyper one day will be the case. And it never happened at all. Well, maybe free will is worth that, right? So it's kind of a hyper-time version of the free will uh, Mm -hmm. defense. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So there's some different things I can do with this. I can say, do I actually have good reasons to hope? I don't know. Well, here's one possibility for how things could be in the future. Exactly. This is at least a possibility. So my hope isn't completely ungrounded. Yeah. Don't tell me, don't tell me that, that, that we can deductively prove uh, once you grant the premise that that there are evil things happening now, uh, Mm -hmm. that there's no, there's no good and all powerful God. No, you can't deductively prove that because, you know, this is what Van den Wagen talks of as a defense instead of a theodicy, right? Right. I can I can show you a metaphysics that's at least epistemically possible uh, in which the suffering we see around us is consistent with an all powerful, all knowing, all loving God. And and uh, the way it's rendered consistent is on the supposition that this evil is hyper temporary. Do I know that it's hyper temporary? No, but I don't know that it's not. And therefore you Mm. haven't you haven't disproven theism. Um, Right. So if I've got good grounds to be a theist, whatever those grounds are. Um, the existence of evil isn't in and of itself uh, a proof uh, that those grounds, those other independent grounds I have for theism are somehow uh, faulty. Uh, no, it could be the case that the evils we see around us are hyper-temporary. Okay. Was there anything else you wanted to say before we get into the objection time? Um, oh, well, let me, uh, no, not mm-hmm. really, but let me just make this distinction between uh, UF and NME just one more time so that mm-hmm. it, it's it's clear when, okay. when Tyron and I engage with Mateson, we're really using uh, the scene changing theory uh, as a tool to kind of get rid of all pain and suffering in the past, right? And that that seem that seems to be uh, a job you could only do if you accept the Ishpitz's doctrine of no more evil. That there will one day be the case that, that, that it, it hyper one day will be the case that there never was any evil at all. You may think that that's too audacious a hope. That you won't even allow yourself such an audacious mm-hmm. hope. Uh, then at least you might help yourself to ultimate forgiveness. And ultimate forgiveness is 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 the doctrine that at least the moral evils conducted by the truly penitent. At least those evils, hyper one day, will never have existed. And you know, and again, I, I'm I'm offering people grounds for hope, however audacious they may be. And I suppose when it comes to hope, uh, it depends where your kind of where your audacity limits are calibrated, right? But I mm-hmm. offer them both. Um, NME is more audacious than UF, but they're both rendered so Goldschmidt and I argued possible by a scene changing ontology of time. And you could believe in them both. You could think at once at one stage of of, uh, of hyper history in the hyper future. Uh, first of all, God will uh, forgive the penitent by erasing their sins and only their sins, um, and maybe punishing severely all of those sinners who aren't penitent. And then at a later stage of, of of hyper history, God will make it the case that that there was no evil at all, and perhaps also no punishments, right? Right. Uh, because no sin. Uh, so it could be that you actually hold on for one reason or another to both hopes. Okay. I'm ready for your objections, Ryan. Cool. But first, let's hear some heavy metal. Objection time! 
All right, so Sam, so now I've got sort of like a better understanding of your view, and I want to try to get in some objections here about your hypertime story of salvation. Because again, on this show, I, I think one of the best ways to fully understand someone's view is to see it from the inside out, see how they deal with objections. Sure. Uh, and so this first objection, um, so my friend Robin, she she's taught me some Yiddish words. Uh, so I'm going to see if I'm using them right in this, uh, this objection here, see if I can try them out. So, so imagine that like I, like I, sh- I schlep all the way across time and I get to heaven. And I'm standing there before God and I just, and I just start schwitzing, you know, because I'm just so anxious about all those sins I've committed in the past. <laughs> and, like, and I know that, like, you know, I've already asked God for forgiveness and you know, I know he's going to grant it to me. But, like, I still feel all this guilt for my past sins. And, like, God might say to me, like, you know, don't worry, Ryan. Like, I made it the case that you never did any of that stuff in the past, so there's nothing to feel guilty about. And you might be thinking, like, I should feel some kind of sigh of relief here, sort of like a thank goodness I never did those sins in the past. But, I mean, but here's the thing, though, like, like Sam, I've, I've read your book now, you know, so like I know all about hypertime. And, and so like, I know that I still hyper did those sins in the hyper past. I mean, I didn't do them in the past, but it is the case that I hyper did those sins in the hyper past. Mm-hmm. And so what prevents me from feeling lots of like hyper guilt? And like at the mm-hmm. moment, like I'm, I'm starting to hyper schwitz, you know, uh, just to like, thank you about this hyper past. So like, what, like, what am I going to do here? Good. I do, I, I do want to cure your hyper schwitzing as well as your mm-hmm. schwitzing. And, and this is a, this is not, this is a nice objection though, at least a nice concern. And because this is by far the most speculative part of, of the book, of, of a very speculative book, and this is yeah. the, the most speculative part, um, I have the luxury of being able to offer you a number of possible solutions without necessarily you know, endorsing any one of them, right. offer them as, as options. Right. So w- w- one um, possibility that we play with, uh, Goldschmidt and I, and I develop a bit further in the book, if I'm not mistaken, is that perhaps God's changing history will have a knock-on effect such that it will change your memories, right? So we have this, we have this uh, possible theodicy that we call the divine proofreader theodicy that's kind of like God says, creation, take one, scene one, you know, act one, scene one, take one, go. Mm-hmm. And we all just kind of act out uh, history uh, with complete freedom, complete autonomy. And at the very end of, of, of history, God says, cut. Now, that was really good. You did a great job in scene one, scene four, scene eight, whatever. But scenes two, three, you know, uh, five, six, seven, they were horrible. I mean, what were you <laughs> right. doing, right? Um, and, and at the next stage of hyper history, we hold the good scenes constant and we get a chance of reshooting uh, the places where we went wrong, and and maybe in the second uh, the second shoot, uh, the reshoot, we might do better. There might be fewer scenes in need of uh, of, of reshooting. As as the number of takes converge on invin- on, infinity, on infinity, the likelihood of having a um, a final cut without any bad in it converges on certainty so given enough takes we'll get to a stage uh, uh, after a finite number of takes actually you know because the last the last one in this sequence that converges on infinity the, the first of the good takes of the, of the universally good takes what you'll have is a history where nothing bad happened and every single action was freely commissioned by uh, those people who took part in it. Now, if you if you look, there, there are more details that need to be sure. fleshed out, and you can look in in the book. There might be times where God actually needs to intervene with a more heavy hand, like a like a script writer or an editor might need to do in order to kind of make the whole story coherent. There there might even be times where God has to write the script for us just to link certain scenes together. But you could imagine him doing that kind of in conversation with previous takes such that he's completely inspired by the things we freely did in in earlier takes. But kind Mm. of, well, anyway, but on some of these models, when you're standing at the pearly gates, you won't remember doing anything wrong, right? You, you are right now in the middle of hyperhistory, and that's why you have some bad memories of doing bad things. But, you know, in the end, when you get to the hyperpearly gates, uh, the, the hyperpearly gates, when you get to the pearly gates at the end of hyperhistory, um, 
um, you you won't remember doing anything wrong. So there'll be no need to switch and no need to hyper switch, right? Uh, um, I suppose you're hyper switch because you say, I don't remember doing anything bad, but I read Sam's book. There might be yeah. all sorts of horrors in my. It's even yeah. worse now because I don't even. You know, like, you know, who knows what was there? I suppose if, if that's the case, you should recognize that what you remember is more important, mm-hmm. right? What you remember is what God was kind of guiding you towards, right? So there are all sorts of horrible evils we could have done, and your hyper past is is as kind of metaphysically formative of who you are as your modal profile is your modal profile is just the things you could have done the things you could have been the things you could have okay you know but by the end of hyper present that by the end of hyper uh, future that uh, by the end of hyper history hyper, by the end of hyper history your hyper past will be as kind of significant to your identity as as your modal profile yes it's true you could have done all sorts of horrible things right thank god you didn't right? yeah. um <laughs> Alternatively, in a completely different model, maybe God leaves our memories intact. He does remove uh, those those episodes from our history that we're most ashamed of, and he informs us. He says, look, I know you're really, really, you feel really bad about what happened. You, you're schwitzing. Don't schwitz. It's okay. I sorted it out. It's no longer there. I don't even remember it, so you shouldn't. And we can say, how can, how can God even remember it? Well, it doesn't exist for God to remember God has some sort of de dicto description such that he knows what hyper was the case. But he can't call the scene up before him in the way he can call up concrete events in history. Because concrete events in history exist. Events of hyper history don't exist. Right? Right. So even God's memory of it is kind of more tenuous than his memory is of, of, of the real past. God says, look, Ryan, you're schwitzing. I don't want you to schwitz. I know you remember it, but it's a false memory. Don't feel bad. I've sorted it. If you go back in your DeLorean, you won't see yourself doing it anymore. Now, you, what you remember is something that hyper was the case. In a sense, you remember it more vividly even than I do because it's a false memory, and I have no false memories. Okay, But the thing is, uh, you're going to turn around and say, yeah, God, but I still feel like hyper shame and hyper guilt. Well, maybe God at that point will turn around and say, Ryan, I'm glad you do don't want you to feel guilt you did nothing wrong i forgive you but hyper shame and hyper guilt is basically just humility Mm -hmm. it's the recognition that though you did nothing wrong there but for the grace of god go i i I could have done right and maybe that's appropriate so god has affected some change for the better both both ontologically and psychologically psychologically he's made it the case he's given you some sort of convincing therapy by which you can learn to live with your memory um, um, more kind of securely because you know it's false. And he's actually improved the, ont- the world's ontology because he's removed some of the evil that was there in the past. You're hyper schwitzing. Good. That's just kind of, that's like a moral thing to do. You know, mm-hmm. We should all be hyper schwitzing. Perhaps, perhaps we should all be hyper schwitzing about, you know, our modal profiles. It's shameful. The fact that I am the sort of person who could have done X, Y, Mm -hmm. and Z, but I am. I am the sort of person that could have done X, Y, and Z. I'm glad I haven't, but I'm the sort of person who could have done. So maybe we should all feel uh, that, you know, that sort of shame about our modal profiles, just like we do about, you know, should about our hyper past. That's just, you know, that's appropriate shame for all of us, the sinless and the sinners among us. So that's how that, that's how I'd respond. And I think there's lots more ways I could sure. respond as well, because there are just so many different models, depending, like I said, about, upon how your audacity is calibrated. Right. Yeah. I'm just glad we got to use the word schwitzing. I don't know, maybe <laughs> yes, like 20 or 30 I, times. I think, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So I've got, <laughs> I've got one final objection to run by you here. Um, so this one's a little bit more detailed. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I've kind of got this worry about the coherence of the timeline if I've got this sort of morphing block that, that you're working with here. So like a moment of time or an instant of time, it's often taken to be like a, what's called a proposition-like entity that can be actualized or, can, or made to be concrete. And so a moment describes the way things are, but could be subsequently otherwise. And, and, and moments have their content essentially, because any difference in content would be describing a different possible moment. And so as I see things like a timeline is just a particular ordering of moments, 
And so what I'm trying to figure out is what happens to the timeline when you start switching out these past moments with new moments. So to take this, this present moment, for example, so this present moment doesn't merely describe what is happening right now, but it also describes how things were before it. Because part of the way things are now is such that the world was a particular way. So, for example, part of the way things are now is such that you and I are talking about an objection that we previously discussed, uh, that we already agreed to discuss. So part of the way things are now is such that we're living in a universe that was created by God. Like, that's part of the actual past. And so Ulrich Mayer, he's a contemporary philosopher of time. So he says that a moment of time describes everything that happened before it. And so here's where this problem kind of arises in my mind. So if God changes even a single moment of the timeline, like he's going to thereby be changing every moment that happens after that. And so what this means is that God cannot replace a single moment without replacing the entire subsequent timeline. So if I think about God forgiving Adam and Eve for the sins in the garden, if God replaces their sinful act of eating the forbidden fruit, then God's going to be replacing like the entire subsequent timeline. And so that that means like replacing all of the people and all the temporal parts and all the other sort of stuff that existed on that timeline. And so that looks like God is not changing the past, but instead it looks like he's like eradicating everything, including all the people that had existed. And that doesn't sound like ultimate salvation for the people uh, in that original timeline. So how would you maybe respond to a worry like this? Okay, so I want to respond on two fronts. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first is that, you know, given how speculative uh, I'm Mm -hmm. being here, and that's the whole, I suppose the whole point is because we're making sense of hope, uh, that that it's okay to be. Uh, speculative uh, in in this project, we are commandeering the imaginative fruit of various metaphysicians yeah. for the sake of hope. And in that mission, I'm going to help myself to as much metaphysical machinery as I might need, so long as it's not incoherent. Right? Okay. And um, if it turns out that I need to adopt some sort of substantivalism, such that you know an instant of time isn't just a description it's not individuated in terms merely of a description of what's going on at that instant of time but no there these there's something substantial in and of itself you could think of a bare instant right Mm -hmm. it just has its own hexaity property right it's you know the 6th of july 1983 that's my birthday right that day has its own hexaity and it's not individuated by the things that go on there if, if it turns out that I need to help myself to such a metaphysics in order to uh, render uh, these eschatological tools of God coherent, then I'll do so, you know, as long as they make sense. And it seems to me that substantivalism about time is, is a going contender. It's got some problems, but so does so do every yeah. ontology of time. You know, it could, could be. Uh, but, but I want to say something more substantive, uh, and this is my second response. And, and that's why I actually think your objection has multiple parts to it, it could be. I think there's one objection in the heart of what you're saying that actually is it targets much more than just my eccentric theory. There's something that I call the, rash, the, the riddle of rational regret. I co-edited a book with, uh, Ty, with no, no, I did something in my life without Tyron Goldsmith. Right, really? <laughs> yeah, I, co- I co-edited a book with uh, Aaron Siegel and Daniel Rabinovitz. Don't worry, Tyron wrote a fabulous chapter in this co-edited book. <laughs> so he's it's still called, involved. He's still involved. It's called Jewish Thought in an Analytical Age, um, the book. And uh, there's a chapter in that book by Saul Smolansky, who's a colleague of mine at the University of Haifa. He's a secular Jew uh, uh, and, and not, not a believing you know, religious Jew. And he raises the following puzzle. And the puzzle goes like this. It says, if the past were changed ever so slightly, the past just previous to my birth, to my conception, then I wouldn't have been conceived. Right? So had, had um, my mother and father left the window open in the bedroom such that the temperature was slightly different on that fateful night, that, that really causally could have had an impact such, mm-hmm. that a different, such that a different sperm would have been the winner. Right. And you wouldn't be talking to me today. Somebody else would have been born. Right. This is a notion of the principle of non-identity. Right. So so which which in a nutshell says that kind of our identity is very fragile, such that you make even the smallest of changes to the past before our conception. And we just won't be around uh, to to witness the different, you know, how things were different. It says, well, if that's the case, can we rationally regret global catastrophes 
right? Because mm -hmm. we all owe our existence to them. Okay. So had it not been for the Holocaust, there are lots of Jewish people who would never have met and never have, have, have married and never have conceived a child together. And therefore, lots and lots of Jews who exist today exist because of the Holocaust. In fact, lots of African-Americans exist because of slavery. Right? It's just inconceivable that had there not been the slave trade, that their parents would have ever have, have met or, in fact, that their parents would have been conceived. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, we certainly want to say that it's rational to regret these, these terrible evils in the past. On the other hand, you know, you might think that regretting your own existence is like a sign of some sort of pathology, right? right. It's some sort of like a mental ill health. Um, you should go and talk to somebody if you regret the fact that you exist. That's, uh, you might think. So how do you, how do you square all that? And I actually think, uh, um, Judaism has an interesting response. Um, there's a midrash that talks about Adam, as in the first man, mm -hmm. um, seeing in heaven all of the souls that would ever be born. And he actually saw one soul that only got the chance, and a majestic soul that only got the chance to live for a day. And, and it's, that's such a shame. God, can I give 70 years of my life such that that soul should at least get to live for 70 years? And if you do the maths, um, Adam in the book of Genesis lives for the very believable age of, of 930. That's right. right. But that seems like 70 years short of a round number. And King David lives for exactly 70 years. Right. So the Midrash imagines that those 70 years were given to this majestic soul by, by Adam because otherwise he wouldn't have had this chance. But this tradition uh, speaks to the idea that there are a finite number of souls that God created and that they're all going to get a chance, some longer, some less long. So, right. And um, and in fact, there's, there's an, even an idea that the Messiah won't come until all of the souls that God created have had their turn. Right. So we're just waiting for that number, uh, whatever that magic number is, to, to have had the chance to live on Earth and uh, do whatever it is they're supposed to do. Um, so if that's the case, then no. Even if Adam and Eve didn't eat from the tree and they'd stayed in the Garden of Eden, you would have been born. God would ensure that you'd be born. History would have looked remarkably different that you'd have been born. This requires quite a lot of metaphysics. It requires the denial of a certain sort of essentialism because it's very unlikely that you'd have been you know, embodied with exactly the same DNA. That's part of um, Saul Smolansky's point. But if you think of yourself as a soul rather than a, uh, an organism, a soul wearing an organism, mm -hmm. um, then, and if you look at the book, Goldschmidt and I have some quite wacky ideas about how God could render uh, the final uh, version of history at the end of hypertime. He could render it a coherent story with both no bad happening, but also giving space for all of us to have existed in some shape or form. It might look very, very different to how things look in the hyperpresent. Um, but again, depending on how audacious you, you are, you might, right. you might, hope, you might for, hope for a history in which, okay, there was a fall from the garden of Eden, but it was like an innocent mistake or something like that. And, you know, and, and, and we all came to be born in, in ways that are quite, quite similar to our own life, just without uh, as much pain and suffering. Or, uh, you, you, you might you might think no we're, we're all got, it will have been the case that we will ha it hyper will have been the case that we never left Eden and uh, and our hyper future biographies are going to look very very different but if you maintain that we are souls rather than you know uh, Homo sapiens then then we can survive much more radical edits of history than I think Saul Smolansky allows for in his mm -hmm. paper in the book. And I think we anyway need that because I, I, I think we do want to say that uh, I think it's a neat way that the theist who believes, like a Cartesian theist, the theist who believes in the soul can say, no, we really regret slavery and we really regret the Holocaust but that doesn't mean we regret coming into existence. Right. right? And, and, and that's a kind of a, a neat little thing that we can say that others can't. 
So yeah, I want to make sure I'm following this because because uh, the, the argument you've you've given here, like it's, it's similar to one that Hasker gives as well, because he looks at that problem of do you really hate your life so much that you mm-hmm. you would rather not be born in order for God to have a different past? And <sighs> so we've got two moves. It seems like so one is to go okay. So Ryan, you said that like the content of moments is essential to moments, and you're like, no, there's some other metaphysical stories to give where mm-hmm. that's not the case. So you can have that moment, but it could have different different content. Mm-hmm. Well, now we've got this problem about like what's sometimes called origin essentialism, which is like mm-hmm. my origins, like where I come from, that's part of my identity. So you change just something slightly, then I don't exist. Somebody else exists. Mm-hmm. You can go, well, why should I think a thing like that? If uh, if I'm already committed to something like substance dualism, and yeah. I know I certainly am, um, yeah. well then, yeah, it changed something slightly different. Maybe your body would be a little bit different, but like God just attaches you to that that body or whatever story you get to how a soul gets attached to a body. Yeah. Uh, so... Ooh, there we go. So not the entire timeline not being eradicated. Um, And the contents, it's a bit different, but those people aren't being eradicated because those people could exist without with with a different origin. Exactly. So Mm -hmm. so you know, and I I I am a substance dualist when it you know, in 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 some senses, because I'm an idealist. Right. Uh, but but I, I'm open to the idea that in the story that God tells, there are two substances, right? Mind and matter. So sure. and I think it's actually a quite plausible description of the reality in which we live. I think, our, but 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 I want to say that I think that origin essentialism is probably uh, the wrong way to think about identity, even if you're not a substance dualist. I, I think know, so too. But yeah, uh, Arif Ahmed in his book on uh, on Kripke, uh, Arif is uh, Professor Ahmed is a um, is a materialist. Uh, um, I'm pretty certain uh, that we're going materialist, but he he thinks that like origin essentialism is just a bad view. Um, so, so there are multiple things I can do. Yeah. Like you, mm-hmm. you said, uh, as you summarized, uh, I, I, I can deny that times are individuated in terms of what happens at them. I can deny the way that origin essentialism interacts with this objection by saying, mm-hmm. oh, 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 my origin isn't the origin of my body because I'm not my body. I'm a soul. Right. Or you can even just deny origin essentialism altogether which I think is like a slightly different. Uh, yeah, different exactly. Thing. So highly <laughs> speculative, but you've got options. Yeah. Who, who I am uh, um, might not depend upon how and when I started, you know, irrespective of your fundamental ontology, whether you're a dualist or a materialist or an idealist. Yeah, I've got options. And, and, and basically um, that's, that's the theme of this of this episode because my response to both of your objections to be well there are options you yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> this is a speculative thing there are options right and so i guess in closing like again one of the things you said in the first episode we did and that you said make really clear in the book is you've got these three principles of, of judaism um there's lots of different ways to flesh them out so they don't have to be committed to the way that you're fleshing them out but you're like here's a highly speculative metaphysical story mm-hmm. that you think it's plausible it hangs together really nicely Yes. It's a way to at least establish that something like Judaism really could be true. Like there's something yes. going for it here. That's right. Now, a lot of this, I think, could be just adopted by other believers in Abrahamic faiths. So if I'm right, that Hasidic idealism, which is what we spoke about in the first episode, if I'm right, that Hasidic idealism follows from theism or from a doctrine of creatio ex nihilo or whatever then muslims and christians should adopt it too and i'd mm-hmm. be very happy to have the abrahamic community of hasidic idealists yeah. <laughs> I think that's a lovely a lovely idea um and a lot of what i say about eschatology right if i'm right that uh you know that the scene changing theory is epistemically possible and, and this would allow god to improve the past then perhaps all of us uh, believers in an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent God should help ourselves to the hope mm-hmm. that however dire things seem in the present, it might just be how things seem in the hyper-present. And it is a hyper-temporary episode. And one day, God won't even have to wipe the tears from all faces because no one ever will have cried. Okay, um, That's offered to everybody. However, both of these doctrines, um, God changing the past and Hasidic idealism, are among the most eccentric parts of the book. Um, they're, they're offered to everybody of all Abrahamic faiths, and none, mm-hmm. but they're also the most eccentric parts of the book. The parts of the book which I think are less eccentric are actually more essential to Judaism, and, and a Christian and a Muslim might have to deny them. And those parts are to do uh, with specific details of revelation and specific details to do with our eschatological hopes. 
basically our eschatological hopes are calibrated in such a way that that um to disqualify jesus mm -hmm. right so, right. so uh, you know so a christian is not going to be able to accept how how the third principle of judaism defines an eschatological hope fine but that's at least useful because now we can talk about you know where and why we disagree right and and um and likewise the role of the law of moses i think um is different and the significance of sinai as a historical event i think is going to have to be different for the jew and the christian for reasons i spell out in the book right so it's kind of fun the things that we've focused on in our episodes on, on my book and i'm so grateful ryan that you've had me uh, on your show but uh, the things we've spoken about are the things which though most eccentric are also most transferable it, it, you know, it, it, if you find yourself incredibly scratching your head and going oh my goodness this is so paradoxical but i think it might be right then it's fine because yeah. he's quite consistent i think with, with christianity and islam and, and uh, perhaps other faiths too all right well sam thank you for coming on the show this has been hyper fascinating to talk to you today. <laughs> thank you ryan i was hyper schwitzing about it uh, okay. um, but it's been really fun thank you and there you have it another episode of the reluctant theologian podcast Stay tuned for episodes on divine friendship, ethics, and biblical interpretation.